This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 657, recorded on Wednesday, February 7th, 2018. Space is now open. Hey, everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with a Tesla in space, reciprocal grooming, and urine. But first... <laughs> Twist is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The next great discovery might be hiding right under your nose. No, it's not a mustache, lips, or even an adorable chin. But it could be that some of our greatest scientific finds are already well within our grasp, just waiting for us to notice them. And when we do... We often wonder why we didn't before. So much of what we discover seems obvious in retrospect. that We often forget how much work went into making it so. That's because that's what science does. It's an endless pursuit of the obvious, confounded at every turn by a universe that makes no sense. Until, by keen observation, it obviously does. And the rest of... The results of a billion observations is what has made the modern age. That and This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And the good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back again! And such an exciting week this week is. Oh my goodness. I honestly think a momentous occasion occurred this week. Something that will, is one for the history books. And we're going to talk about it. I have stories today about space, X, <laughs> and urine. What do you have, Justin? I've got dead Vikings, why <laughs> India will be patient zero, rising mercury, and blue pee. Ooh, that's two for urine. That's yeah. right. That's why it <laughs> needed to be, needed to be, uh, just oh, people needed to be warned right up front about this program. Okay, Blair, what's in the animal corner? I think this is the one time I don't have urine, which is very upsetting. <laughs> you took a potty break before the uh, show. <laughs> yeah, I have um, cooperative rats. I have woodpeckers and football players, what they have in common. And um, I have um, catastrophe. No. <laughs> Why? Why do you have to be bringing the catastrophe? You'll have to find out what's killing you right now. <laughs> Up next at 11. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's something always trying to kill us. Yeah. It's called life. Mm -hmm. <sighs> As we jump into the show, everyone, I want to remind you all that you can subscribe to our podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube and on Facebook. If you look for us this week in science, just about everywhere good podcasts are found and also on YouTube and Facebook, you will find us and you'll be able to subscribe. Also, you can subscribe and find information by visiting twis, dot org. But now it's time for the science. Dun, dun, dun. Ten, Rocket, nine, biggest. Eight. Right, you're doing the seven, countdown. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Blast. It's a star man taking Wait, to the skies. Yeah, so it, the story is not about David Bowie, but it is about SpaceX and Elon Musk's old Tesla and a spacesuit that's supposed to be like a star man who's sitting in a Tesla on its way to the asteroid belt at this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm not sure. I haven't, I, I've been trying to keep track, but uh, earlier today, somebody uh, who keeps track of objects that humans have put into space, who is on Twitter, uh, he is keeping track of this and was letting us know that it is well on its way past the lunar orbit wow. within within today. So as of the uh the broadcast, the airing of this podcast, there is a Tesla with a spaceman outfit just jetting itself through the emptiness of space. And I, and I will admit to having been insanely busy this week and only caught like a some sort of headline that was being... Like yeah, cars in space? Yeah. No, no I, thought, I thought David Bowie was actually in the Tesla. Um, about his body they're like well no, 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 this no, is no. his last wish we finally found a good way to do it and like okay i'm like i bought it like i didn't read the article which would have been well actually david bowie's not in the space but that's <laughs> was my take so i'm like did that really send david bowie to space in tesla because that would be pretty awesome yeah well the tesla is the big folly of this news piece actually the it's tesla the red it is. It is the thing that people are kind of talking about, but it is not the thing that is the most exciting at this moment in time. As of yesterday afternoon, uh, SpaceX launched the Falcon Heavy rocket, which is about twice the size of any other rocket on Earth. And they launched it with almost 100% success. The rocket itself launched quite successfully no mishaps what whatsoever it jettisoned its two boost two of its three booster rockets uh, which landed in yes. this choreographed beautiful yeah. ballet balletic <laughs> landing at almost exactly the same moment it was beautiful that to was, observe that was the coolest part by far yeah the, the the fact of engineering and technology enabling such uh precision in 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 these big explosive things that go boom and have you know rocket fuel involved um but this falcon heavy rocket it successfully the, the it, this was its test launch to show proof of concept that this is a lifting vehicle for extremely large payloads to be taken not just into earth orbit but to be taken past earth orbit and that was the point of the jettisoning of the payload tesla cargo that if it was able to reach a speed and a, a velocity that would allow it to escape earth's gravitational field and to move into a a, a trajectory that would take it past mars so proof for Elon Musk and his dream of one day putting people on Mars that we can get a vehicle there using their his rocket. And additionally, it will go past Mars and out to the asteroid belt. It will obtain, the, the Tesla will obtain a fairly stable orbit that should last at least 10,000 years, if not longer, <laughs> without any, without much decay. Now, the uh, the rocket itself, because it was so successful, showing proof of concept, what it means is that we are going to see companies hiring SpaceX and the, the Falcon Heavy rocket system for launches for scientific and other payload payloads in the future. And it says to SpaceX, go for your big Falcon rocket. The BFR is the next rocket in line. <laughs> it's going to be, and it, it may, that, that F in the middle may or may not actually stand for Falcon. Yeah. <laughs> big flippin' <laughs> rocket? Is that what yeah. it stands for? Big Falcon yeah. rocket. Yeah, big, that's big obviously. Friend, big friendly rocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, the BFR is the next rocket in line for development. And since this was so successful, it means that they may put something even bigger on the launch pad, which will enable um, very large manned missions into space. Mm -hmm. So as of yesterday, Wednesday, for all the folly of the tes Tesla, the rocket launch itself was proof of concept and did indeed open up our future in space. Yeah, I think the really 
the really exciting thing that I heard that I had to kind of read a second time was the fact that these rockets had already been used before. The boosters. Yeah. yeah. And so they this has a huge implication for the future of space travel in general, because the amount of money and metal and and all this kind of stuff that we use to make everything from scratch every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is a huge breakthrough to be able to reuse this stuff. That's pretty great. Yep. Yep. It makes it, it makes it, you know, it's, this isn't sustainable in the least. I mean, it's, it's, this is a lot of rocket fuel. There's yeah. a lot of parts involved. There are things that are not reusable, but the fact that parts of it are reusable yes. makes it cheaper and easier to do it over and over again. And I hope, and I really do think yesterday's launch uh, will be an inspiration for today's gener- generation of youth who may be interested in a future in space. I mean, this opens Absolutely. up the yeah. asteroid belt to mining. We can yeah. get there, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. The yeah. expanse will be true soon. <laughs> exactly. We, we, we may be heading there faster than we uh, than we thought. Although I'm still trying to figure out like why we would need to mine an asteroid. Like we're on a pretty big one that should have everything. <laughs> like somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not mess up this asteroid that has life on it. Why not go mine resources if we if we can get to them easily so we can preserve the planet that we have? Yeah, the it's for the unobtainium. The unobtainium, that's unobtainium. right. Um, Eric in Alaska is commenting that he's not sure he would agree that the Tesla was a folly. Fair enough. It got attention. Absolutely. I think it's one of the best, most amazing bits of performance art ever (laughs) it's beautiful um but he said the dragon capsule itself was first tested and when it was it flew with a large wheel of cheese on board Hmm. so if we're talking about folly yeah yeah fair point yeah and and other test vehicles throughout our space history have flown with test payloads of water sand Mm -hmm. concrete Mm -hmm. And yeah, cheese. <laughs> yeah. So now, so what if uh, if Elon wanted his original roadster up there? We get it. And who knows? Maybe when our expanse future actually happens, <laughs> that Tesla might be a a, a historical monument in space yeah. that yeah. people will go visit. Oh my god! Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> right. The first thought I had was like, I wonder how many decades will pass before some other billionaire decides that would be a great trophy to have and sends a mission out to have it retrieved. To right. collect it. Yeah. To collect it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's oh put it goodness. in a museum. Yeah. Yes. Well, as we look out into the universe, we see all sorts of stuff out there. And one of the f- human follies that we have is to maybe one day leave this earth or to find other habitable planets where life may have gotten its start. And one of the groups of planets where we have been looking is the uh, the TRAPPIST-1 star system. Now, TRAPPIST-1 is a pretty small, not very bright star. It's pretty cool, but it is surrounded by a number of planets, seven in all, that uh, are very close in orbit, much closer than the Earth is to, to our sun. But close in orbit they orbit around the trappist star very quickly several of they're all rocky and seems as though they have atmospheres of interest and so nasa has been training the hubble on the trappist system and previously in may of 2016 the inner trappist one planets b and c were observed but now they have reported on three more of the exoplanets, D, E, and F. And these atmospheres are of, of particular interest because they, if when you look at the spectra, the waveform spectra of, uh, of planets, they look at how there are particular signatures, light signatures that occur 
as light passes through those gases. And the, the technical description is gas giants have a puffier atmosphere because mm. they are made that atmosphere is made up of lighter elements like hydrogen and helium whereas atmospheres like earth, like earth has have much heavier elements so we've got the carbon we've got oxygen we've got nitrogen we've got elements that actually are a little heavier and make the gases a bit denser so in looking for atmospheres that might be conducive for life and might indicate atmospheres that would lead to maybe water oceans on the surface of the planet, they're looking for these indicators of a denser atmosphere rather than a puffy atmosphere. And that is exactly what they found. So in these three Trappist planets, they don't see puffy. There's no puffy. So... The next step, they don't know if there is water on the surface of these planets. This is not something that they are able to look at at this point in time. But when the James Webb telescope gets up into space, it will be able to take a much closer look at the TRAPPIST system to be able to determine exactly what elements, what molecules might be present in the atmospheres of these planets and whether or not oxygen and, um, and even water are a major part of them. So next step on the Trappist system, this system is very interesting and exciting. Uh, it, it formed very differently from our solar system. So in addition to being of interest, because there are these rocky planets within the quote unquote habitable zone of its star, where life could potentially be growing, it's also allowing us to look at a, a star system that has rocky planets that came to be in a different manner than our own solar system. So it can help us it, through observation kind of answer questions about solar system development over time. What kinds of situations lead to certain kinds of systems? And that might lead us to being able to train our telescopes onto more likely contenders for habitable systems in the future. Yeah. And I think there's also a fair bit of envy and imagination at work. And that if we, if our own earth was in that sort of a system, uh, then the other planets, which could also be potentially habitable are right close by can be seen in the, in the night sky. Even. I mean, there's, there's something of a, of a little bit of sci-fi romanticism about that as well. And it's great. Yeah. You know, the, that if, if it has the atmosphere, one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why water we think is so crucial for life to exist uh, isn't a necessarily a characteristic far beyond water being such a good solvent that mm. things get to mix and interact at a much greater level than they would in any other condition. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, water is possibly the the best overall solution to start uh, life in. So. So that so that's part of why we 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 look at a planet like that that could have an atmosphere that could have water, and go okay that's where we need to look versus you know an arid or, or, or rocky frozen tundra type type of location. Yeah, and then my final story to start out the show is another look even further. The Trappist system is within the Milky Way galaxy. And so far, all of our observations looking for exoplanets has been, have been within the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, we haven't even looked at the entire Milky Way galaxy, but because of the places that we have looked, we have an estimate that there's probably only about one planet per star in the Milky Way galaxy. Right. What? Yeah, it's an, that's the estimate. I mean, that still leaves room for like a trillion planets. <laughs> it's a mind-bogglingly big I thought, number. Where did that come from? I thought our number was that our planet, our, that our solar system actually was turning out to be pretty average. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know about this Ooh. one per star. I thought it was in the like seven, eight, nine range. Um. That's curious. Well, well, I will look. We'll I will look check. that up. Yeah. 
um, no, this is something that we will, uh, that I will look up to confirm. Um, yeah, but as far as I am aware, there's about an average of one planet around every star. Now, because of the different types of stars that there are, that doesn't mean that all of the big, big stars that maybe they don't mm. have planets. Gotcha. And so there's it for the type of star that we are we're probably an average solar system, but not all stars have planets and not all planets have stars, right? There are supposed to be wandering planets out there who have escaped the gravitational confines. Yeah. The rogue planets, but that's not exactly what this study is about. This study published February 2nd in the astrophysical journal letters researchers used information from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and a technique that's called microlensing, which we, we've heard of before, to study a distant quasar galaxy. But in their distant qua quasar galaxy, that's a galaxy that's not in the Milky Way galaxy, right? This is not something within our own galaxy. We use this micro, this gravitational lensing, usually to be able to, um, as uh, space time is warped around uh, gravitate, highly gravitational objects, massive objects, we can use the way that it is warped to be able to bring distant objects kind of into closer focus as if there were a lens in between us and that distant object. Mm -hmm. That lens is just space time, <laughs> which is fascinating. But now they're not just using this gravitational lensing, they're using micro lensing, which allows them to get even higher resolution on very distant objects. And what they have posited is that their micro lensing technique has enabled them to spot exoplanets in this quasar galaxy. Planets, little teeny tiny planets in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> so this is, um, it's, it's still, they're, they're publishing their work in the hopes that other researchers will take a look at what they've done and help them determine whether or not they're right. But as objects move very quickly, and they say that planets, because they're so small, and in this lens, this this lens, micro lens that they have, they'll just pass these objects, planets will move really fast through the lens. And so uh, they'll move faster than stars, which are larger and not moving in the same direction and moving and moving differently. And as a result, they want to know whether or not other researchers think they've gotten it right. But if they have gotten it right, it brings the estimate outside of our galaxy that there are approximately 2,000 extragalactic planets for every star beyond the Milky Way. So whereas there's possibly only one planet per star in our own galaxy, there are 2,000 times that number <laughs> beyond us. I'm now, having trouble with this. But like I mentioned, the rogue planets, that's one aspect of this, that there are possibly these, that many, many galaxies contain rogue planets wandering through the galaxies. They possibly, there maybe there are rogue planets wandering between galaxies. But Kiki, that's so many. It's so mind-bogglingly huge. It's trillions and upon trillions of possible planets. But then at oh, some point, don't you just call them asteroids? Yeah, or, yeah, or, I guess so. Really big asteroids. Yeah. It's like, I don't think <laughs> definitions. Oh, come on. If you're not around a planet, if you're not in orbit around a planet. You mean around a star? A star. Oh, thank you, sorry, thank you. If you're a planet yeah. not you're orbiting not a star, a planet, you're cold if, and dark. If you're, not, if you're not in orbit around a planet, you're not a moon. If you're not in orbit around a sun, you're not a planet. I mean, this just is, we got to get the definition. If Pluto's not a planet, then neither are these inter, intergalactic big objects floating about. <laughs> this is not, we'll just not call them BFOs. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> big friendly objects. Big friendly objects. Big free range objects. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
That's right. Free range planets, as says Bleak in the chat room. Yeah. That's so, a lot. That's a lot of planets. A lot of planets. There are probably many dark ones, but it's and cold ones, but the mind boggles at the possibilities of what is out there. What's the what's outside our solar averages. system? <laughs> yeah. What's outside our solar system, outside our galaxy, out what's outside? Let's keep looking out, everyone. Up and out, up and out. There's just so many. Ah well, Blair collects her wits a little bit. She's mind blowing a little bit. Justin, what you have? What you, you know it's not friendly? What? A great heathen army. <gasps> True. <laughs> or the great Danish army, depending on who you ask. Oh, my ancestors. <laughs> um, <the> big friendly <laughs> army. <laughs> they're That's really, <laughs> they're really with them. Uh, so this was a great big group of Vikings led by uh, uh, the three sons of Ragnar Lothbrok against the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. It's a team of archaeologists led by Kat Yarman from the University of Bristol's Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. He's discovered that a mass grave, which was uncovered back in the 80s, dates to the right time frame to be a burial site for the Viking army fallen. Uh, early dating of the site had put the precise dating into some question. The results they got from these large groups of, of bones were coming back scattered over several hundred years. Now, part of the problem was they found things like coins that were dated within the, the 872 to 875 AD. So the coins were all minted within three years of each other. There were Viking weapons and artifacts, axes, knives, those sorts of things that you would expect to find with the Vikings. Those were there. And yet, and yet the, the carbon dating was coming back over hundreds of years, confounding any definite pegging down. And there's historical records that also show that the Viking armor wintered in this location. This is Repton, Derbyshire. Uh, there's, there's records that say that the that Viking army wintered there in 1873, and it drove the Mercian king into exile at this time. So there's good records everywhere except with the hardcore science record, which was flailing about a wide range. So a uh, pretty interesting place they found here. There was uh, several Viking graves and deposits of nearly 300 people underneath a shallow mound in the garden of a church. Uh, probably had really good roses growing there. With them. That's right. Well fertilized. <laughs> well fertilized. Uh, within, and so there was uh, an Anglo-Saxon building that was partially ruined before, before being turned into a burial chamber for a lot of these bodies. One room, uh, one room was packed with commingled remains of about 264 people, around 20% of whom were women. So again, we find female Vikings being right there in the midst with the dude Vikings. And, and it doesn't say that 20% of Vikings were women. Um, it's just 20% of the dead. They may have been 50-50, but maybe women were much better fighters. You know? <laughs> the yeah, maybe they survived much better, right? So, so okay, so everything that is pointing to this is that great heathen, great Viking, great friendly army, uh, but, the, but the dates are, are wide-ranging. So previous radiocarbon, this is Kat Yarman, the previous radiocarbon dates from this site were all affected by something called marine reservoir effects, which made them seem much too old. So the idea here is when we eat fish or other marine foods, we incorporate carbon into the, our bones that is older than the carbon that is on the surface of the planet that we're usually interacting with. And since radiocarbon dating is a system that was really designed for dating things in reference to carbons on a land-based level, well, the carbons that these fish were interacting with that these Vikings were probably eating a lot of were affecting the radi radiocarbon datability of their bones. So they went back, they did some estimates on about how much seafood <laughs> each individual may have been eating, and uh, it kind of gave them, set them back into the right range of 
the uh, you know eight hundred late eight hundred ADs. The some of the there's some interesting artifacts. Uh, one grave contained two men, one of which was buried with Tor's hammer pendant, which is a very old Viking sort of uh, trinket, uh, Viking sword, several other artifacts. He had uh, one of those members had received numerous fatal injuries around the time of death, including a large cut to his femur. And intriguingly, he had a boar's tusk placed between his legs. And it has been suggested that the injury may have been uh, a severing of his own boar's Whoa, tusk. Whoa, what? Yeah. yeah, they're like, oh, let's try to put them back together as best we can. Yikes. There was, uh, yeah, there was another grave with four juveniles between 8 and 18 buried together in a single grave with a sheep jaw at their feet. Uh, with signs of traumatic injury. So, pretty interesting overall. Uh, it's 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 I I hadn't I was not aware of this this thing of the uh, eating fish can give your bones older carbon. Um, I have all the old carbon. I might. I eat a lot of I eat a lot of tuna fish. I wonder if I have like like if you were to radiocarbon date me, would I be like three hundred years old? I don't know how this works exactly, but <laughs> I I feel like I might eat almost as much fish as a Viking. Probably. Take a liking to a Viking. They smell like fish. In other news, research shows that dye and methylene blue. You know what methylene blue is, right, Kiki? Yeah. What do you use it for? All sorts of dyeing things blue. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, like tie dye? Do you use it for tie dye? No, no, no. It's like for cell counts, for, for cell, cell viability. Counts, yeah. So right. you 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 mix your cells that you want to count with this methylene uh, blue and the dead cells because the outside of their cell walls have decayed take on the dye whereas the living cells don't and so you can do a cell count under a microscope and say you're alive you're alive you're alive you're alive you're alive dead dead you're alive you're alive dead dead and you Mm -hmm. count them up and then you have the viability of your culture right so turns out it may be a safe anti-malarial drug uh, in usage uh apparently kills malaria parasites at an unprecedented rate. Within two days, patients are cured of the disease and, a little bit more importantly perhaps, no longer transmit the parasite if they are bitten again by a mosquito. That is is, huge! Right? This is a discovery made by Redbound University Medical Center scientists and international colleagues during a research project conducted in Mali. Um, As a side effect, if somebody accidentally pokes you, do you bleed blue? No, but you do pee blue. Ooh, that's fun. <laughs> right? So now you've piqued my interest. <laughs> so okay, so malaria parasites are increasingly resistant to the uh, resistant to the therapies that we're currently using. In addition, these medicines that we currently use do not really stop the spread of malaria because the parasite remains in the blood. And if another mosquito comes along and bites a a person who has been cured, they can still transmit malaria to somebody else for for weeks. Right? The parasites uh, split into the, the in the patient's blood into male and female sex cells. So these was it gametes um, are still present and then taken gametes. up. Yeah. Gametes. Gametes. gametes get taken up into the mosquito stomach fertilized come back out in mosquitoes saliva that's the sort of life cycle of that parasite so yeah biting cured patients still spreads the disease so in this uh, study the researchers added methylene blue to the current therapy so it's not methylene blue by itself right it's with the current combination of drugs that they're using to fight Uh, malaria but when it's added patients were no longer able to infect mosquitoes within as little as 48 hours which is just fantastic patients who were not given were still able to affect uh, infect other mosquitoes for at least a week they had done some previous laboratory experiments but this is the first time these effects were seen in humans and yeah it makes your your pee 
turn a bright blue. Although I'm wondering if if those patients, if they like started taking vitamin C pills for a while, could they could they get it to turn green? <laughs> I, like, I, like, I, like, this is like, I want to try. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's funny. One of the uh, the comments about the side effect of the blue urine is that they, they they need to solve this problem because patients might stop using the treatment if they see their blue urine. Whereas I find that kind of a fun side effect. Ah, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's new and different hey no that's exactly what Justin was talking about too like what happens if I uh, take some vitamin C what happens if I eat some asparagus (laughs) what's gonna happen I'm so excited to find out (laughs) yeah this is uh, I mean but I'm just wondering I mean how from your disclaimer at the beginning of the show, you know, it's like once you find something, it's like, oh, of course that we know that. But sure. how was this not discovered and used sooner? What are the challenges? I want to know what the issues are here because we've had methylene blue for decades. And it's in every lab, everywhere. It's, everywhere. it's in every lab of anywhere that's ever worked on malaria. Exactly. So. <laughs> What's the, there's a schism here somewhere and I don't understand and I want to know more. Right. And, and part of what I want to, the story I want to hear is why would you, why would you try this in the first place? Like, was it, was it like, was it like an accident in the lab? Mm -hmm. Like, oh no, those, those you weren't supposed to give to the rats. That's actually what we're supposed to put under the microscope. Oh, look how well they're doing. Oh my goodness. Like, I don't know. Like that's, I think probably the hidden story. That's even more fantastic than the, than the, the P turning blue. But, uh, there is an yeah. article. So this, this article, probably, uh, this methylene blue for treating malaria, um, from, from the article, the description of the intervention, Paul Ehrlich discovered that dyes that tar- target certain microorganisms and leave the surrounding tissue unharmed could be used as drugs. In 1891, methylene blue was discovered to fit into this category for malaria treatment. 1891, it was first discovered. What? It has high affinity for plasmodium parasites and low toxicity to patients. Ehrlich's students continued to trial methylene blue, but it was not sufficiently effective to supplant the standard treatment with quinine. But since then, methylene blue has been approved for the treatment of methemoglobinemia, prevention of urinary tract infections in the elderly, treatment and prevention of iphosphamide-induced neurotoxicity, and intraoperative visualization of nerve tissues, endocrine endocrine glands, and fistulae. It is a tricyclic phenothiazinine drug with a characteristic blue color. Um, Its half-life in humans is up to 5 to 10 hours. Usual daily dose is 200 milligrams. The bioavailability of methylene blue after oral administration is 72% with peak plasma concentrations after two hours and an elimination half-life of 18 hours. So I can maybe buy some of this over the counter and turn my pee blue just to... It sounds like it. (laughs) It sounds like it, yeah. That is pretty great. (laughs) And perhaps the next twist short. (laughs) (laughs) oh my oh my yeah so this is fascinating and i i would love to know how well this works in a clinical setting and if uh if patients go for it that would be great to know it would it would this is this week this week in science we're here i think we have covered one of our urine stories that means there's another one yet to come in the second half of the show but right now It is time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Oh, I have some exciting news. Um, First, 
rats cooperate. <laughs> Wait, we knew about that. Uh, so there's a new story about how rats cooperate. Uh, this is a study on Norway rats um, from the University of St. Andrews and the University of Bern in the UK um, and in Switzerland. And they wanted to see how rats would, uh, how they would interact with each other if they both needed something. So one got salt water applied to their neck in a place that they couldn't reach to create a situation where they needed help. They needed to groom to get that salt water off. It was bothering them. And then another rat had access to, didn't have access to food, but the rat that needed grooming did. So they had partner rats. They had them have the ability to pull food items toward the rat that didn't have access to food. So after that, then they had the opportunity to reciprocate the favor, grooming the rat, or offering food to the rat after being groomed. So they did this in multiple directions. Grooming, then eating, eating, then grooming. And they found that grooming was a cooperative action that was provided to food providers more often than those who had not been provided food. And rats provided more food to groomers. So it went both ways. So there was this very clear exchange for goods, kind of like goods and services. <laughs> it was kind of like, That's it's right. not described this way in the article, but to me, it sounds like payment. It sounds right. like, here's some food. Now, will you do me a song and take care of that salt water? <laughs> I, scratch, you, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different because it went both ways. If it was only ever, here's food, now take care of me. It would be more of a payment structure, I think. But because sometimes it was, here's food, now take care of me. Oh, you took care of me, now here's some food. Since it went both ways, it was more of just a recipro reciprocal action. So the fact that they're trading surfaces shows direct reciprocity. I help you because you help me. So this is something that... You know, this is the age old story that this is something that previously was thought to be cognitively demanding and therefore unlikely to show up in non primate species. Well, mm. shocking. Here it is. <laughs> the thing that I found so interesting about it, though, is that it does kind of have this weird similarity to a bartering or payment structure. So it's not grooming for grooming food for food it's not i remember much much later that you took care of me a long time ago so i like you it's an exchange one for the other so you scratch my back i'll retile your kitchen there you go <laughs> exactly so this is that's that's why the paper is called reciprocal trading of different commodities in norway rats so this is something like a barter or a payment system that rats do. We know rats are very smart. We know rats know who their friends are and show kinship. But now we also know that they're willing to exchange food for goods and services. Yeah, I think I think the different goods and services is the most interesting aspect yeah. that it's not simply the food related at thing. And we talk sometimes taking it to the kind of the anthropomorphization. Um, we, in psychology, reciprocity is a huge aspect of so sociality, that right. reciprocity is part of the glue that builds social ties, where if you do something, it's like, it's, we, we've talked about it before. So if, um, if Justin at the car dealership gives somebody a cup of coffee. Mm. Hey, do you want a cup of coffee? You know, then the the person is has to buy a car. Has to buy a they're car. Yeah. They have no <laughs> <choice>. <laughs> well, they're less likely to assume that you're ripping them off, really. 
Yeah. It starts building. It's building a little bit of trust back and forth. It's this, I gift you, you give something back to me. Um, it's, it's often, you know, why if somebody invites you to dinner or to visit their house, you bring a gift with you when you come, you know, you are exchanging these goods and for a social event for a social evening. And, um, it's something that definitely is part of human behavior. We don't often understand exactly why we do these things, but you know that it is good to do it. And right. sometimes just saying thank you or being kind is a gift in itself. And so there are multiple levels. To yeah. Well, and it's also behavior. We've talked on the show a bunch about the biological root of quote unquote morality too Mm. because that's something that a lot of people think is uniquely human but a lot of these things that we consider to be moral helping those in need being kind to your neighbor yeah this is written into our being because it's how you stay alive Mm -hmm. (laughs) absolutely i mean we've shown this in extremely social animals like rats we've shown it in really solitary animals still there is something to be gained by not being a jerk (laughs) (laughs) ultimately yeah there's a reason there's a reason we call jerks jerks and why we don't like them it's because it's beneficial to everyone to be nice it is yeah that's right you people out there it's beneficial to be nice says blair and moving on to uh, something that's not so nice, hitting each other repetitively. Uh, <laughs> did any of you watch the Super Bowl? I did. It was a fabulous game. Okay, oh, well, was great. In light of that, let's talk about our favorite uh, little element of football: chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yeah, and there was one uh, one player early in the game who got his head knocked and he hit it on the ground and he was out, out yeah. on the ground. Cook, taken to the Cook's, s- Cooks got that. He did some really weird thing. He actually, what was what was odd is when I saw it, he looked disoriented actually before he got hit, but he got mm-hmm. hit helmet to helmet. And was out, and and that was that was probably the scariest hit I had seen, mm-hmm. the collision I had seen all year, and it was it was there in the Super Bowl, and he yeah, wasn't the only so, one. But he, he was out the for, the rest, the, mm-hmm. out for the rest of the game. Out for the rest of the game. So the, the, the problem. One of the quarterbacks also at the end of a play, uh, the opposing player did this to the refs to indicate he was unconscious on the ground. Oh boy! Twice in that same game. Well, when you get hit really hard in the head, there is often brain damage. And the signature of brain damage that you can see usually comes in the in the form of tau proteins. So um, Kiki knows all about this in in her many, many uh, hours over a hot brain. Right. Maybe? Mm. No? Um, Well, in brains, you have your neurons, you have your um, axons, which are like the telephone wires that connect the neurons. And then um, what happens is normally in a healthy brain, you have some tau proteins around those axons. But from trauma, you get a buildup of tau proteins. And that's often a signature, a telltale sign of brain damage. And so researchers from the Boston University School of Medicine wanted to look at woodpeckers to see what was going on in their brain. We've talked about this a little bit on the show before. Why? Why don't woodpeckers have CTE? Why are they able to stand up straight? How are they just not riddled with brain damage? Well, Well, they've got padding in their heads and they've got special elastic bits in the back of their necks to absorb the shock. So their yes. brain is not, right, right? That's what we learned, right? Well, so I we've think. learned that by looking around the brain. But apparently, mm-hmm. nobody has done a large-scale study on woodpecker brains themselves looking for brain damage. So this study is fascinating because the Field Museum and Harvard loaned researchers bird specimens from um, over 50 years of specimens. All of these specimens were pickled in alcohol and they used 
downy woodpeckers, and then they use non-head injury prone red wing blackbirds as a control. Right. Red wing blackbirds do not throw their head repeatedly against wooden objects. No, blackbirds, right. they're singing in the dead of night. So that's a very good baseline to look at the brain. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at the downy woodpeckers. They took these bird brains, quote, the braids themselves were well-preserved. They had a texture almost like modeling clay. Kiki, yes? Mm. Maybe? That's Pickle a pickle brains? brain. Pickle brains. Uh, I've always thought of them more like garbanzo beans. Okay, garbanzo beans. Very good. <laughs> then they took incredibly thin slices, less yeah. than a fifth the thickness of a sheet of paper. And mm, then they icons. stained. Yes, they stained the brain tissue slices with silver ions to highlight tau proteins. They found woodpecker brains had far more tau protein accumulation than blackbird brains. So based on what that usually means in animals, we would call that a sign of brain damage. Mm -hmm. But we can't say that for sure. All we know is that there's extra tau present in woodpecker brains, which is a brand new discovery. What now we have to look at is if if pecking was going to cause brain injury, why over 25 million years of woodpeckers would they still be banging their head against wood? So there's something else going on here. And the expectation is that potentially the tau proteins in woodpecker brains are part of a protect protective adaptation and might not be pathological. So the next step one would expect is to try to dissect brand clean woodpecker brains hmm. from woodpeckers that have never hit their head upon wood. So this is a very interesting question to me also, because there is a question among the uh, Alzheimer's literature as to whether or not, and this is where the Tau and the, the chronic encephalo encephal encephalopathic uh, disorders this tau protein, we're, we're using it as a marker for disease because we see the, mm -hmm. the plaques, these tangled proteins building up in, in diseased brains, mm -hmm. in damaged brains. So it's correlation, but mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. know if it's causation. Right. We do, right. And so this You're is exactly an interesting right. point to be bringing in comparatively and evolutionarily, mm -hmm. what are the tau proteins doing? Are they just a byproduct of damage? So right. is the cause, whether it's smacking your head around being a football player, mm -hmm. you know, for the, uh, for the, the brain damage that leads to disorders and degeneration later in life, is that phys the cause, the physical damage, the stretching that leads to other metabolic issues in the nerve cells and then the tau protein production, same right. for Alzheimer's disease, but a more um, immune system cause that leads to damage, that leads to tau production, that's a marker, but not the cause. Um, and is this, again, a marker and not a cause in the woodpecker, right. pepper, woodpecker brain, um, where though maybe the brains themselves are not damaged enough to cause uh, debilitating neurodegeneration within their lifetimes. Right. And so the further we can figure out what's going on here, believe it or not, this could actually help us on our way to figure out how to treat neurodegenerative diseases and how to prevent them. This could actually help us save brains in the future. So the more we can know about the origin of the tau proteins, the function of the tau proteins, why they're there, and how the woodpecker is able to exist can mm -hmm. actually help us protect brains, which would be pretty great. Um, the yeah. other thing that's really special about this study, which I think we've talked about a little bit on the show before, but for anyone who's gone through a museum collection and seen thousands of dead birds in um, in jars or in 
in roll out drawers or all these sorts of things. This is exactly why those collections currently exist. And this is exactly why they're so important. So the Field Museum, they have one of the world's biggest and best bird collections, most diverse, all these sorts of things. And they get hundreds of requests for specimen loans every year. They specifically chose this one because it had real world applications and they were able to send specimens that were collected as far back as the 1960s. These specimens, these bird brains and jars were cared for for over 50 years until they were eventually cut up and used for this experiment. So these museums hold an immense catalog of information that we don't even know yet. And as as much of a bummer as it can be for someone who loves animals to see drawers full of dead birds, that could actually not only help us, but help other species in the future. Mm-hmm. And museum collections are just so important to the field of science. It's it, it's a really it's a really good demonstration of that. And and if you don't love dead things, you really don't love animals. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Fair that's point. All about dead things. Yeah, that's very true. It's very very true. All right, everybody, it is time for us to take a quick break. This is this week in science. We will be back in the second half of the show with urine and thermometers and a lot Ooh. more. So I hope that we will see you there in just a few minutes. Stay tuned for more This Week in Science coming up in a minute. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We do appreciate you being on this pleasure cruise of science that we like to call Wednesday evening. Everyone, if you're here tonight, if you're here listening to the podcast right now, you know that we do this every single week and we do it because you're here with us, but we also need your help to keep doing it. So I would like to ask you all to head over to twist.org where you will find all sorts of ways to help twist out. This Week in Science is supported by your donations. We are not currently supported by any advertising. It's you who help us keep this show going, help us keep the lights on. So here is how you can help us out and how you can make things happen. Twist.org, we have donation buttons. So if you scroll down to the side, you'll be able to find a nice yellow donation button that leads you to a PayPal interface. So if you like PayPal and just donating through the PayPal system, click on that button. It'll allow you to donate an amount of your choosing and um, however you'd like to do that through PayPal, right? Now, additionally, if you click on the most recent episode or any of them, among also the wonderful show notes that you will find, you will also, if you scroll to the very bottom of our notes, find pink buttons that allow you through PayPal to set up recurring payments, $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, recurring month after month, so that you only have to set it up once and it keeps working using PayPal to uh, help us out in an ongoing fashion. If you like the ongoing fashion thing, but aren't keen on PayPal and would love a little bit more interaction with us here at Twist. You can help us out on Patreon, and there is a link for that at the very top of our website. Click on the Patreon link. That will take you to patreon.com slash thisweekinscience, and that will allow you to click on a button, become a Patreon member, and help us out in an ongoing fashion at whatever level uh, you choose. And in in return, there are many premiums that we offer uh, in return for your help to keep the show going. Now, uh, going back to our main website, you can also help us out by buying merchandise, wearing shirts that say this week in science on them, having a mouse pad, mug, maybe a tote bag. Where do you find those things? Oh, our Zazzle store. So you click on the Zazzle store link that will take you to the Zazzle interface, zazzle.com slash this week in science, where there are all sorts of items with the Twist logo, and also with artwork from previous years, Blair's Animal Corners, calendars that you can enjoy, share with loved ones, other people who enjoy Twist. 
but also help us out because a portion of the proceeds do come back to us to help keep the show going. Additionally, if you're over at twist.org and you haven't subscribed to the podcast or to uh, our feed over on YouTube or anything, why don't you click that big orange subscribe button? Subscribe to This Week in Science. Tell your friends to go to twist.org and subscribe so that they are part of getting uh, getting This Week in Science to whatever device they like on a week after week after week basis so they never miss the fun science. Don't miss this show. It's too fun. You click on the YouTube. You can subscribe, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And you know what? We just got our first donation over on YouTube this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, our viewer who donated over there. That was amazing. I really didn't know that was a thing. And then it was a thing. I saw it happen. That's so cool. So if you watch us on YouTube, you can donate directly through YouTube. And that'll go to our, uh, our account and help keep the show going also. Thank you so much for your support here. If you're not able to help out financially, if you're not able to keep help us keep paying the bills, what you can do is tell people about Twist. Lead people to twist.org. Lead, lead them to our Facebook page. Lead them to our podcast. Get them to subscribe. Help us out that way. Grow the Twist family and help us just keep doing what we do and bringing you Twists week after week. Thank you so much for your support for your ongoing support, because we really could not do this without you. And we're back with more this week in science. We are back. And I know what time it is right now. Time for... What? Yeah, it's time. It's time for this week in What Has Science Done For Me Lately? Lately. This is coming in from minion Brian Von Wert. He writes, what has science done for me lately? I have what used to be called Asperger's and is now known as high functioning autism. One of my conditions is I have a lot of issues with directions. My wife called me directionally challenged. I must stop and think before I know my left from my right. When it comes to travel, I need to travel a path several times before I learn how to get there on my own. GPS has been a great advantage to me, helping me to get to work, home, and many other places without a personal navigator. And I'm going to add also without getting lost. That's awesome. Thanks to GPS, I have been able to see Gettysburg, Yellowstone, and the Grand Canyon. I haven't seen those places yet, so I'm jealous. <laughs> road trip, twist road trip. Twist road trip, yeah. GPS is amazing. It can, uh, I remember years ago not having these wonderful GPS devices, these palm of the hand, amazing magic computer machines that we have now, and having books of maps and compasses mm-hmm. and my trunk full of maps to be able to navigate to various places and print I'm, out a map quest map. Right, that was later. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was a little bit later. Yeah. But it is a different world now. And I can, I can just imagine the freedom that it would be allowing you, Brian, to be able to get places easily and hopefully without mishap or minimal mishaps, but yeah, uh, just make sure mishaps are just adventures you didn't plan on. That's right. That's as long as it wasn't a mishap, like you're looking at your phone and not looking up and you step into the road and that's not, yeah. oh, no. don't, don't do that. Bad. Don't do that. Um, Brian, thank you so much for writing in. I appreciate you sharing this with us and sharing it with our audience, allowing me to read this on the air tonight and to take a moment to stop and think about the, you know, the wonders that GPS and technology are allowing us today and people who are directionally challenged, which every time you go to a new city, sometimes it's hard to get your bearings and GPS can really help you out. 
Everyone out there, if you would like to write in, please do. Let us know what science has done for you lately. What has it done? Share it with us. Tell your story because it does give us time to stop and think about these things. And I think we all need a moment to stop and think and appreciate what it is we have in this moment that is the future. We live in the future. Come on, tell me how science is helping you, everyone. Leave us a message on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisweekinscience. Or you can email me, Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com. Dot com. We're going to keep it going. Keep it going. I want to get this full year in, everyone. Help me make it to Earth Day. One year of what has science done for me lately. Let's do it. You need to write in if you haven't yet. Come on, get on the computer. Send me a note. Carrier pigeon. <laughs> write it in. Justin, what kind of science do you have for me right India. now? India. <laughs> India. Maybe home to the next multi-antibiotic resistant pandemic. Rut row. Not yet. However, millions of unimproved antibiotics are being sold there, according to a new study by researchers at Queen Mary University of London and Newcastle University. Published in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, they found that multinational companies continue to manufacture many unapproved formulations of antibiotics, despite publicly pledging to tackle rising antimicrobial resistance. So these findings highlight serious hurdles for controlling antimicrobial resistance in India, which has among the highest antibiotic consumption rates and sales in the entire world. Researchers examined figures for fixed dose combinations. These are antibiotic formulations composed of two or more drugs in a single pill, as well as single drug formulations of 118 formulations of Fixed dose combinations being sold in India between 2007 and 2012. The team found that 64% or 75 out of the 118 were not approved by the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization. And only five of the formulations were approved in the UK or US. The 118 fixed dose combination Formulations uh, gave rise to over 3,300 brand-named products uh, made by almost 500 pharmaceutical manufacturers, including the multinational companies. So by 2011-2012, this form of antibiotic combo pill made up a third of total antibiotic sales in India. Yet 34.5% of these sales were unapproved formulations. That's 300 million units of unapproved formulations. And many of these, these combination formulations were poorly chosen and likely to exasperate resistance problems. So he also found that uh, multinational companies manufactured nearly 20% of these uh, and the single formulations that were sold. Wow. 20 of the 118 formulations manufactured by multi multinational companies had no record of approval. And only four of the 53 formulations had U.S. or U.K. regulatory approval. And they keep throwing that in as though, or I suppose, because I guess the U.K. and U.S. are supposed to be the higher regulatory standard. Industry. Right. They know more and regulate more strongly. However, there has been a lot of controversy um, in India about its central drug standard control organization's ability to implement or even even um, not able to implement or to or, regulate uh, enforce. To actually, yeah. Yeah. To any enforce. of the standards that they yeah. propose. So that's also part of it. Lead author Patricia McGettin from Queens Mary says, Selling unapproved, unscrutinized antibiotics undermines measures in India to control antimicrobial resistance. Multinational companies should explain the sale of products in India that do not have the approval of their own national regulators. And in many cases, do not have the approval of the Indian regulator 
in which they're selling these products, manufacturing and selling. So, you know, this is just a really bad situation where where you I mean, and I and I guess and I guess it's, you know, it, it, from the way at least this article, had, the impression I was left with was that uh, perhaps because uh, actual physician care, I'm, I'm assuming this isn't going through physicians that you're prescribing. Uh, Some of it probably them. is that there's that the, that physicians are definitely going to be prescribing unapproved antibiotics. It's possible, but yeah. the, the impression I kind of got from this is that it might be more along the lines of not having a direct physician access. And so these non prescript like people are self medicating antibiotics to treat what all ails them. Um, yeah. And it, I heard, <laughs> well, I, heard, I know here people in the United States often, if they can't get what they want from their own doctors or insurance companies and pharmacies, it, Ten, there, there are people who order from India and mm-hmm. other places where things are available. Mm-hmm. So there oh, is sure. and, the greater and, and, availability and, of items and the greater use of items. Yeah. Right. And I don't want it to sound like the United States standards of self-medicating are much higher than in the rest of it. No, no, no. But we self-medicate in a way that uh, that kills people. And so it doesn't <laughs> spread. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's that's different than creating a resistance amongst diseases that then no other nation or peoples can counter. Um, that's so yeah. it's a little bit of a frightening pandemic-y type situation uh, brewing in these these um, wild, unregulated usages of antibiotics. This sounds like a good reason for a for a an awareness campaign worldwide. Only take prescribed antibiotics and take them for the full course, or we're all screwed. Thank follow you. the instructions. Make sure you read the instructions twice yeah. and follow them. <laughs> all the way. I feel better. I don't need to take it. No, take it. Take the whole really bottle. Like I really need it. No, you don't. You're missing the whole concept of this. How this works. Mm, my oh my oh my. Ah, uh, yeah, it is scary. It is very scary, but one of the interesting ways that we are hoping to get past antibiotic resistance is looking at the bacterial world itself and uh, what informs us very often is how bacteria interact with their own viruses, the phages that live to prey on bacteria. Mwahahaha. Yeah. So we get sick from viruses. So do bacteria. And so there is this ecosystem that is full of things. And all right, I got a story now about bacteria and phages and urine. Mm. Yeah. You're in luck, everybody. Yeah, you are in luck. So researchers from Loyola University, Chicago, published in the Journal of Bacteriology, uh, their findings of the bacteria and phages that exist in the bladder microbiome. And they have discovered, well... It's been long known, according to one of the researchers, Catherine Putonti. She says the thought that there's not bacteria in urine is false. Mm-hmm. Big picture is that there are a lot of viruses that are part of these bacterial communities as well. So that whole thing about you can drink urine because it's sterile. It's probably Actually, just- it might be true. You can probably drink your own urine because it's your own microbiota. Exactly. But you wouldn't want to drink someone else's urine. It might be also And there's this whole clean catch versus not clean catch kind of stuff, right? But look, okay, so here's here's where I'm going to get out ahead of your story a little bit because I haven't read it. You haven't read my story at all, and you're jumping ahead. What are you going to say? I want to jump ahead just a little bit just just to what you're saying. It, It then doesn't matter if it's sterile. If the viruses are eating, are, are protective, if they're filtering, if they're killing bacteria that you wouldn't want in your bladder, 
then they may be helping prevent infection. This might be a layer of the immune system. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it might actually be safe to pee on your skinned knee or whatever. You know, like, like there, might, there might be something to it and to the extent that it hasn't gone horribly awry when people have done that. Not that it has a health benefit. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> condoning or promoting this activity, but it may be that it doesn't have a negative result because the virus is that are there and the bacteria there have been screened in that sort of way. But that's just my thing. Yeah. So uh, these, these phages, these viruses of bacteria, yes, they can be very beneficial and they may be involved in fighting infections like bladder infections. They may be involved in the entire health of various systems of the body. And so, of course, researchers want to find out more about how these ecosystems work. And so for this particular study, they looked at 170 urine samples from women with or without urinary tract issues. Uh, Women are more often likely to, uh, to contract urinary tract infections just as a matter of anatomy and how things are set up. The samples were collected by people studying the issues in women, and they used catheters to collect the urine from the bladders themselves so that skin or vaginal bacteria weren't messing up their analysis. This is a direct sample from the bladders themselves. They found 181 bacteria across various families of microbes, and they looked at their genomes. They analyzed the bacterial genomes using a tool called Veer Sorter, (laughs) which uses modeling and viral genetic data to look for what are known as prophage sequences. Now, prophage sequences are segments of DNA that are like dormant viruses within the bacterial DNA. So when phages infect bacteria, uh, particular phages, they will get into the bacteria and insert these sequences of DNA so that when certain environmental situations pop up again, they can use the bacterial cellular machinery to replicate and then feed on the bacteria once again. So these prophage sequences are indicative of uh, having these bacteria having been infected previously and the potential to uh, re- the, of the phage to reassert itself at some point. The researchers found 457 potential phage sequences in the genomes that they looked at, and about 86 of those bacterial genomes had at least one phage, if not more, up to, uh, up to like 10 phage sequences in some. 226 of the phage sequences were pretty, pretty right on the bullseye. They're considered high confidence sequences in that they're very likely to be these prophages. Um, 97% of those, 97 of those 226 were similar to prophages found before that have been seen before. And 129 have never been seen before. So Mystery. these are yeah, they're mystery bacterial viruses. Um, and they noted in the, the article that certain phages, acetomycetaceae, were found in women with overactive bladders. And so there may be um, these phages for the acetomycetaceae. Oh, my. <laughs> If I can pronounce this very large bacteria. Yeah, 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 I guess. The, the, phage, the phages, the viruses for that family of bacteria were really active in these women whose bladders are overactive, which may indicate that phages are involved in the health of the bladder, or at least in that aspect of the health of the bladder. Um, and so this is bringing things together in a way that has not been observed before. And next, they're going to hopefully start looking into more aspects of the ecology of the bladder, of the lady's bladder, to determine um, whether or not phages can be used to manipulate 
that ecosystem in the future? Are we going to have, do, do you take an antibiotic to treat your bladder infection? No, maybe you'll take a phage in the future. Oh man, that'd be so cool. So it's, a, yeah, it's and, and potentially different. And but, that's the thing like I, I keep referring back to or thinking about, which is that, that uh, viral load in infants when they get to around age two, they have the highest, highest viral load in their guts that they're ever going to have. Um, and those, those are those bacteriophages. They're, they're viruses that are feeding on bacteria are sort of screening. And so, well, while we're all sort of focused on the probiotics, Really, the the probacterial phages might be the 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 real thing that you want to to put into that system yeah. that can defend it beyond that first meal or second meal of of probiotics, but actually get in there and and sort out what sh- what your what a human body is kind of designed or, not to have. By or maybe, way of yeah. Bacteria. I mean, this is a long term evolutionary relationship that we're mm-hmm. talking about, and. Maybe not only just phages on their own, but potentially phages in conjunction with antibiotics. So maybe the combination of antibiotics and prophages or uh, different in different combinations could allow us to make things work really well. And, and if the antibi- antibiotic is a bacteriophage virus, then right. I, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's antibiotic, kind of anti, yeah. <laughs> right. That's sort of what I'm, yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's the thing, right? Like we, we may just uh, turn out, it might, might just turn out viruses are our best friend. <laughs> <laughs> viruses. That's right. You, you like the viruses. I don't like the flu virus these days, but who who needs a thermometer? Do you need a thermometer? Oh man, man, man yeah, I I, <laughs> I wasn't ready for my training. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making I'm making you oh, say go. Yes, as the mercury continues to rise with global warming, the mercury will continue to rise with global warming. Oh. Researchers have discovered permafrost in the northern hemisphere stores massive amounts of natural mercury. A finding with significant implications for human health ecosystems worldwide. In a new study, scientists measured mercury concentrations in permafrost cores from Alaska and estimated how much mercury has been trapped in permafrost north of the equator since the last ice age. Turns out, it's a lot! Um, study reveals northern permafrost soils are the largest reservoir of mercury on the planet, storing nearly twice as much mercury as all other soils, the ocean, the atmosphere combined. Mm-hmm. That's a lot, people. That is a lot. What? Uh, if you're curious, the study is published in Geophysical Research Letters, a journal of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, this discovery is a game changer, quote a voice Paul, Paul Schuster hydrologist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Boulder, Colorado, lead author of the new study. We've quantified a pool of mercury that had not been done previously, and the results have profound implications for better understanding the global mercury cycle. I'm Warmer- not going to be able to eat tuna anymore at all. Wait, what? <sighs> Wait. <laughs> no, no. Actually, it's going to be fine, because now mercury is in everything. So, uh, uh, Unavoidable. Yeah, this is going to be everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, thawing of the existing permafrost layer in the northern hemisphere. Thawing uh, could release a large amount of mercury that could potentially affect ecosystems around the world. Mercury accumulates in aquatic and terrestrial food chains, has harmful neurological and reproductive effects on animals. So, Bad. there would be no environmental problem whatsoever, though, if everything remains frozen. But it's not going to. Oh, damn. Just <laughs> set up some fans, quick. I mean, we're we're all worried about the methane that's going to get released from the permafrost, but mercury? Yeah. That's going to end up in the rivers and the streams. The rivers and the streams like we used to. And it's going to influence the, the, the tuna. It's going to influence the salmon. It's going to high level. It's going to build up. This sharks, is a bioaccumulating. Sharks have a higher, uh, sharks have a higher sharks. mercury content than, uh, than I don't do. I don't eat sharks. Well, I hope. Hopefully not. Hopefully. Yeah. 
And and since it's going to cause neurological issues, then you're going to have like crazy sharks, right? Yeah. Mad tuna, vicious salmon, who will be eaten by bears, who will go all cattywankas on us. Uh-huh. So it's, yeah, it's, that's like, of all of the, like the, the global warming stories and the, this slow change and that quick change, and this is going to happen faster and that's going to happen. And, and the, the silver linings of Florida being underwater. Um, then all of a sudden we get a mercury dump on top of that. Stop it. That's too much. That's ridiculous. Hmm. Yeah. This just, we need to, we need, we really need to start working on solutions, people. We need to, I mean, we launched a big rocket into space. We're going to be doing a lot more space stuff. We have technology and really smart people to make better technology. Let's start doing more solutions for um, solving climate change, reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so that we don't warm the atmosphere as much as now is estimated it will warm. Please, can we do that? That would be really great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Well, we could if the planet and the warming is not going to, and the mercury is not going to kill us. Uh um, We could just try to live forever. I mean, maybe we'll be like Elon Musk and live forever on another planet. Um, but so last week I talked about naked mole rats, right? Uh huh. There's another story this week about naked mole rats. <gasps> They're the gift that keeps on giving. They mm-hmm. are. So last week was the question of, all right, they don't have senescence. They don't have right. this aging, right? How do they not do that? And then you were bringing up, well, maybe it's telomeres and uh-huh. um, you know, what's going on at the cellular level. Well, our questions are being answered because this there's a new study that just came out this week in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looking at cellular senescence in these animals to determine whether or not their cells are acting like and aging like the cells of normal lifespan or the average lifespan of uh, their related species. So uh, naked mole rats live upwards of 30 years, which is very long for a rodent. And the question is, how exactly do they do that? They seem to stay eternally young and they don't get cancer. Well, when they are irradiated with gamma radiation, it turns out that there is something going on. Their cells can handle a lot more radiation than the cells of other rodents. So there is something going on there. But Just as in the cells of normal rodents, when damage is done to the DNA, it turns on cellular uh, uh, apoptosis processes, which is programmed cell death to lead to, which is basically senescence. And there are metabolic, metabolic cellular pathways that are turned on. So yeah, the cells die just like in normal aged, normal aging mice. They also have cellular senescence during development, which would be, uh, which is kind of understandable because they go through a developmental period in which you can't just have everything dividing and differentiating and doing what it, what it does forever. So for example, in the brain, we have a bunch of neurons in the brain and then they get pruned, right? And it's this cellular senescence process that helps with the pruning of the branches in our brain to to highlight the pathways that are the most important, the ones that actually work the best. Same thing happens in limb development. You, If you want to have fingers, you need to have some kind of cellular senescence that will cut little gaps between the digits, right? Otherwise, they'll all be stuck together and not... Mitten be, hands! And they won't be individuated, right? Horse hands. Right, like a horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so there are processes that cells divide and die. So the cells that connect areas, they die away, and then areas are uh, are separated. So these are important processes during development, and naked mole rats have them during development as well. Um, and there was, uh, and and then during aging, when they actually hit old age, cellular senescence happens 
like normal and so they don't live forever, right? So there is definitely something going on. We don't know why exact, exactly they are able to live so cancer-free, um, but it's not because they don't have this process hmm. by which cells die. So like cancer, you would think that naked mole rats would have tons of cancer because if they don't, if their cells aren't dying off, because that's part of cancer is unregulated cell growth, right? right? Unregulated cell division. And so normal processes in the body try and stop cell division. It's when you have this unregulation, this dysregulation that you have tumor growth. And so you would think naked mole rats would have tumors all over the place, but they never get them. But it's not because they, they have this dysregulation. That's not, that's not what, what's part of it. So there's something else going on. So we, we know are, what it's not. We know what it's not. Yes. They have senescence. There's something else metabolic that's going on that we need to learn more about. And um, additionally, another, another species, not a, not a rodent, but a bat. Myotis myotis. It's also very long-lived, can live up to 35 years, even though it has such a very small body size. Normally, small body size animals, they live fast, die young, right? They burn up all their energy quickly. Well, this is another study in, into a creature that is long-lived for uh, compared to its body size, published in Science Advances. Researchers looked at these bats and discovered they have a whole bunch of genes involved in telomere maintenance that are regulated and upregulated compared to other related small bodied animals. Give me those. Right. Yeah. So these well, this, uh these this bats is have, ruining my well my it's ruining what? That, it's ruining my whole theory that uh uh long life and body hair are inversely related. <laughs> <laughs> They've got yeah. Bats have body hair. Did yeah. Naked you don't have to be rats, naked. Rats they live a long time. Humans, elephants, dolphins. We all seem to live a long time. And then boom, bats. furry little bat. Oh, furry little bats. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, is that these bats though they don't express telomerase in their blood cells, and the researchers say this suggests that telomere maintenance in this species is unlikely to be mediated by telomerase, which is what's implicated in humans. And so, if it's not the telomerase that is involved in maintaining telomeres, then there's something else going on and they have identified 21 maintenance genes in this work that could be involved and so this 21 was pared down from 225 genes they're finding that uh, some are evolving differently in bats or are expressed in a different way and drive our understanding of how better to find ways to lengthen human health span without driving cancer Dun, dun, dun. So naked mole rats, bats. Ladies, give me it all. Give it, give it, give it all to us. Come on, I'm all just the information. Eat a million rats and bats. <laughs> Let help. Naked mole bats. I'll, I'll really, just acquire really, their power. That's how you acquire their power by looking like a naked mole bat. Uh, Blair's Halloween costume for this year, folks. You heard it now. The naked, naked mole, mole bat. bat. That's good. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, get on it, Blair. I want to see it. Okay. Yay. Woo woo. And in other crazy, weird news, did you know that there's a whole bunch of clones invading the world? No. What? What? Yeah. Oh, Marmor Krebs. Marmor Krebs, the marbled crayfish. Ooh. Researchers, yeah. Researchers love the marbled crayfish. It's just a crayfish, you know, it's a pet store, whatever. Anyway. Uh, publishing in Nature and Ecology and Evolution, researchers have um, have told the story of the marbled crayfish and it and it spread from a German pet shop across Europe. Uh, it, 
over the last 25 years. It's it it has spread over the entire world in pretty much less than 25 years. Yikes. Yes, it this German pet shop was selling a species Procambaris phallus that came from streams of Georgia and Florida. And then in the pet shop, suddenly there was a different crayfish and they named it Marmor Krebs, marbled crayfish, because it uh, it was parthenogenic. And that was great. Yeah, we love parthenogenesis. It's all females. The females yeah. produce viable eggs and then more females come. There's You don't need males. They just keep reproducing very easily. Uh, easily maintained species you can put one in a tank and that single female would fill a tank that could then be sold and eaten or put in other fish tanks or around the world and that's what happens and so this wonderful cloning parthenogenically reproducing female species has ended up in the wild and it in 25 years spread around the globe spread around the globe um and it's um an amazing story because uh the success in in its ability to end up in all sorts of ecosystems and it invades environments from Madagascar to Sweden. And there are genes in its gene sequence obtained by the authors that uh, allow it. It's got some pretty neat adaptations. It can break down cellulose so it can eat all sorts of things that other animals can't. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that this, this wonderful little species can do, but anyway, genetic changes, self, cloning it's now taking over the world yes story to 11 folks <laughs> <laughs> well um you know what else is spreading around the globe oh what <laughs> microplastics yay we've oh. talked about them so many times in the frame of ocean pollution but have we yet talked about microplastics on land, no, Wait, I don't believe it's, we has. I it's, thought this was a problem yeah, for ocean yeah. dwellers. It's a problem. In fact, terrestrial microplastic is a higher threat than marine microplastic pollution. There is an estimate of four to twenty-three times more microplastics on land than in the water. Sewage, for example, is full of microplastics. 80 to 90% of the particles contained in sewage are often microplastics, garment fibers, things of that nature. And that, ter- that then gets processed in a sewage processing facility where they often make something called sludge, which is exactly what it sounds like. That is then applied to fields as fertilizer. Then microplastics end up in the soil. So a new study actually looking at the amount of microplastics in soils, in freshwaters, and just in general on land have shown it is a problem. Earthworms make burrows differently when they have microplastics present. Hmm. And um, they also have a lot of health effects relating to microplastics in us. We've shown that uh, microplastics actually can cross the blood brain barrier or the placenta. Yeah, that's not Um, good. So microplastics already all over our food, in our soil, Everywhere is already inside of us, and it's not just from fish in the oceans. So every time I start yelling about, cut out the single-use plastic, here you go, case in point. Hmm. All right. Yes. (laughs) Straws. Straws could be the first to go. Straws can definitely go. And things like... uh, like lunchables that have plastic in plastic on plastic surrounded in plastic. Don't buy that. Well, but I think the Produce microplastics that's wrapped in plastic and then in plastic. Don't buy that. I think the sludge problem. I mean, think of all the plastics in clothing. I yeah. mean, 
That's a That's big problem. Got to be the microfibers. Yeah. yeah. Well, think about you know Probably these things after. all up in the news these days. Tide pods. The thing about tide pods that bother me is the fact that they're they're wrapped in dissolvable plastic, mm. which is going to be little pieces of plastic mm-hmm. eventually. Yeah. The uh, but I think I think a big point too, like all the laundry we do. Wandering around the environment, you have bits of fuzz coming off your clothes. Mm-hmm. The laundry we do, we have little bits of fuzz coming out in the water, also coming out in the dryer lint, and yeah, little plastic fibers, or polyesters. Mm. Yeah, so plastics, they're everywhere. It's, I don't expect everyone to go start wearing hemp and like never buy another plastic thing ever again, but just keep it in mind and then also out i'm just gonna put it out in the aura our filtration systems need to be better they can be better we need to make them better um on our on our uh wash washing machines for our clothes there should be better filtration systems to filter out microplastics we can do it i believe if we can put a car in space (sighs) we can filter out some darn microplastics Yes, we can. We can filter. We can filter. We can do it. Justin, do you have another story for the yeah, end of the show? Story was, uh, just the headline caught me. Um, headline is Child AIDS Paleontologist and Discovery of New Ancient Fish Species. It's a 90 million year old fish never seen before. Discovery was made when this kid was uh, taking a tour of a monastery in Colombia noticed this sort of flagstone on a walkway that looked rather fish-like took a picture of it later was uh, visiting a museum showed it to the people there and they went oh it looks like a fish fossil they sent it to their colleagues in uh in Canada and turns out yeah this is an ancient fish never been seen before but I think my favorite part of this is the fact that this obvious fish fossil was sitting in stone outside of uh, this <laughs> monastery um just just clo- a mile or two away from the museum but that nobody from the museum had ever visited the monastery <laughs> so it remained a secret much longer than it maybe otherwise would have <clears throat> there you go science hiding in plain sight science Yes. Right there under your nose all along. Folks. All along. Oh, have we done it? We did it. We have come to the end of another episode. We have, we have, and it's time for me to say thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone in the chat room and over on YouTube, over on Facebook chatting. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of our show and enjoying and conversing with the other people watching. Love that there are people uh, watching and being part of the community. Thank you to Fada for doing show notes. Thank you to Identity4 for recording the show and to Brandon for helping us to simulcast to Facebook and to our Patreon sponsors. I would like to say thank you to EO, Byron Lee, Kevin Parachan, Mark Hessenflow, Matt Sutter, Ken Hayes, Aaron Luthen, Flying Out, Christopher Rappin, Brendan Minish, Greg Briggs, Robert Gary S., Marjorie, Rudy Garcia, Robert Aston, Kurt Larson, Steve Lessiman, Ben Rothig, Sean Lawrence Lamb, Greg Riley, Jim Drapo, Lisa Slizuski, Christopher Dreyer, Brian Carrington, Jason Olds, John McKee, Paul, Sean Bryant, Rick Ramis, Brian Condren, Richard, Eric Knapp, Kyle Washington, Time Jumper 319, Bob Calder, Bill Kersey, Jason Roberts, Matthew Litwin, Mark Mazaros, John Ratnaswamy, Craig Landon, Jacqueline Boyster, Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Alex Wilson, Steve DeBell, Andy Grow, Joshua Fury, Charlene Henry, Richard Onimus, G. Burton Lattimore, and Paul Disney. Thank you, all of you, for your support of This Week in Science. If you would like to help support This Week in Science, you can do so by heading over to you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just at twist.org. 
And remember that you can help out simply by telling someone about Twist today. And on next week's show, we will be back once again with more great science news. Oh, wait, what is next Wednesday? Valentine's Day. It's time Twist for Valentine's the- Day. Yeah, that's right. The Twist Love Fest is coming yeah. up next Wednesday. Hopefully we're going to get a little lovey-dovey on the show next week. And we hope that you will love to join us as well. Science, for show. will you be my Valentine? Yeah. I'm mad about you, Science. Oh, that might be the scrapey. Anyhow, <laughs> we will be here next Wednesday broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live, where you can join the chat chat room. You can also join our chat room at our YouTube channel. You can find that at twist.org slash YouTube, or you can chat over at Facebook, facebook.com slash this week in science. And if you don't make it, it's okay. Things are archived at all these places, and you can just go to twist.org. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in the iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile-type device, it's Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple marketplace For more information on anything you heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's again at www.twist.org. While you're there, you can also make comments on our shows and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or you can simply contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a... You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. (laughs) This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science. Science. this week in science this week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever-
never see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week. This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, 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 this week in science. This week in science.